Hey, it's Karen Kella. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Bitties. This is the drink as you learn school with two longtime friends. And sometimes just two boozy bitties. What's better than wine? Wine and true crime. We've talked fraud, we've talked forgery, but here we are to talk about some of the world's biggest wine heists. And this is the first part of a two-part series. Drink whatever you like, but make sure it's not stolen. Which might be, well, I guess if it's a merchant bottle, like a typical, probably not stolen. But if you have yourself a couple thousand dollar bottle, <laughs> might be. <laughs> Since mostly what were these wines that we're all going to be talking about in these episodes today, they're obviously very nice wines. No one's going to steal a barefoot right now. Right. <laughs> it's not a barefoot bubbly heist we're talking about. Yeah, that's going to be a... Not very lucrative on the, the black market. No, it's just so. really dumb. This is, I went down a rabbit hole with this, Kara. Like, there's not a ton of wine heists that sound like out there. These are, the between these two episodes, we're really hitting the majority of them. But some of these are just, like, downright comical. <laughs> <laughs> People. Yeah, and some of them, too, it's, like, repeat problems. Australia seems like they had a big problem for a little while. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what we'll dive into to start. I mean... New South Wales, Australia, apparently very bad at tracking their wines. <laughs> and apparently also 2013 was a very bad year for wine heist because like three of them happened in the same year. And it's like all like warehousing and like the logistics issues, right? <laughs> it's just like fell off a truck, literally. <laughs> this is very much, I think all of these well-calculated inside jobs for the most part, like knew what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Right. And, and knew the value of the wine too. Like oh not- yeah, yeah. Like I, like we said, they're not stealing La Marca Prosecco over here. They're uh, <laughs> they're going for the big shit. <laughs> I mean, the first one with like New South Wales. There's two that come out of Australia. The first one listed here, March 2013, sixty thousand bottles of South Australian wine was stolen while in transit in New South Wales. It's also just like, how do you? I mean, you just have to have it all organized, right? You gotta have trucks. That's a lot of wine. It's heavy. <laughs> mm-hmm. It, 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 apparently, so this this truck had 12 McLaren Vale wineries. I think they were all McLaren Vale. There might have been one or two from Barossa Valley or whatever. But essentially, they're all Australian wineries. I didn't recognize any of them. There's Gem Tree, Chapel Hill, I think, actually. Maybe I know Chapel Hill. Tapestry, Sintonata. Either way, 12 McLaren Vale wineries. And they were all unlabeled wines... I guess they called them shiner bottles, but I, from what I was reading, these were wines meant for a private label for a large wine store chain or grocery chain down there. So there were no labels on them yet. They're just unmarked bottles. <laughs> Interesting. So how do they know the value? Are they going to like, do we think the thieves then labeled them to sell them? They, because they never found them in this case. And I mean, I'm assuming like at least the cases distinguish where they were from. You know, I'm sure the wineries had their own special marking on it because wherever they were going, they were going to go get labeled for this private label. So they they obviously knew where it was, but I guess just because they knew like the bill of landing that said what wines were on this, it was there. And I guess it's this company called Wine Works Australia, and I guess they do logistics and warehousing for the wine industry. So companies can send their stuff there just to house them, and then they get transported in some of these incidents. And it was intended, like I said, for private labeling, but this trailer was carrying the wine, and they were found only four kilometers, which is what, like three miles? No. How far is four kilometers? I think, I always think there's like two kilometers in a mile, but I don't know if that's accurate. Yeah, it's not math. It's not our strong suit. But very close to the Sydney warehouse. And so there's this transport group called Wetton Halls express transport group and they were in charge of the trailers coming to pick them up and i guess when they went to pick them up and deliver them to whatever this warehouse or whatever it is this company was in administration and i had to google what that was (laughs) so i was like does that mean they were having an office day like everyone was in meetings paperwork day (laughs) paperwork day i guess in administration means that the company has been taken under the management of an administrator appointed by the court. So it's like an interim boss type situation. Oh, so this must be an inside job where they knew that all this was happening. They must have because these trailers were brought to this depot or something like that. And then they couldn't get in because this place was under administration, like the close. They just left them outside the gates. Seems like a thing they sh- should have been instructed not to do. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
just like whoever was driving, unless they were a part of the inside job, like are they just like, oh, guess we can't get in the gate. Just guess we leave it here. Like they didn't think to like call. <laughs> I'm like envisioning like an ocean's number thing where like <laughs> someone's taken over and is now driving the truck and someone has sent through the paperwork to put this thing into administration, but it's really a fake thing. And there's the other people who are going to take the wine once it's been left. So it's like, you know, a, a number of people job. Yeah. So, but I'm assuming whoever's driving this truck knows it. Cause like if I was not part of this heist and I was, came to a place where I'm supposed to leave, it was 76 pallets of wine. If I'm supposed to get to this place. Yeah. I'm not leaving that outside the I would gates. definitely make some phone calls. Right. <laughs> to be like, <laughs> maybe they did, but then there was another person who had taken over the office. <laughs> it's true. They don't tell us about who was George Clooney and who was Brad Pitt <laughs> in this situation. Right. <laughs> Or Sandra Bullock and... <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, <laughs> the female version. <laughs> right. We have no idea who was doing what job. But I guess they were just, like, left outside the gates. And then someone else just took the... They found the two trucks of the 76 pallets just, like, empty, just miles away from this. And it so also the drivers just abandoned the trucks after they leave them. <laughs> so they, like, took the one... They must have had... They were saying that it was very planned, you know. They must have had, like, forklifts and, like special trucks and storage and stuff like that to just transfer it from this one truck to whatever else they did it in and just disappear with it. It does um, kind of, I found this one guy, Tom Works Fermentation Daily Wine Blog, but he had this post that was like, wine theft, is it the best way to make money? But and he goes, it's heavy. Unless you have a buyer to take it off your hands, it takes space and probably an air conditioned space to keep it safe. It's like wine, you can't just like leave it in the back of a truck, um, a son. And it was more of if you're going to steal much more than two or three cases, then you'll need two or three people to do the job, or in this case, forklifts for 76 pallets. Yes. That was also if you need if you need forklifts, you need your forklift certification. So right. these or people are certified. Know how to drive it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then finally, unless you're going to steal the really, really valuable stuff, um, the weight to value proposition just doesn't make any sense. That's why you do have to target the, the good higher end models. Yeah. So I think this came out to like five hundred thousand dollars in lost wine, which is a lot, but I don't, well, not one of the most expensive heists. Uh, I hate the word heists. It's it's weird to say heists. I feel like I'm a snake with a stutter at the end. But also on top of this, it was a holiday weekend in Australia. So it was like a three-day weekend. So no one noticed this wine was missing until they like returned on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, shit, where's that All wine, wine mate? <laughs> but they, yeah, everything was coordinated and the wine has not been found. It's just gone. It's gone. And a lot of these cases, the wine is not found. They might have found the people in some cases. In this situation, I don't think they ever arrested anyone and they never found the wine. So here we have the perfect wine crime. There we go. But not not the most lucrative, but there's other ones. The five million Australia's prestige vineyards. Yeah. So the second one from New South Wales going on at the same time, (laughs) pretty much around the same time. It's called the Mystery of the Missing Grange. And Penfold's Grange is a very high-end wine from Australia. And it was that and two other wineries called Hench... Oh, fuck. I should have said... I should have put pronunciation notes in these. Torbrex and Henchkes? Henchkes? Sure. Sure. I mean, we we would think our Australian would be better than our French, but... (laughs) No. It's terrible. It's terrible. But this one took like a million articles for me to finally track down how this story worked out because it's like kind of convoluted. They're $5 million, and this is $5 million Australian dollars. At this time, I don't know what that really, I'm sure it's still millions. It's not like it's $5 million Australian means like 40 bucks US. <laughs> like It's like, it's comparable probably, but it was very prestige Australian wine vanished without a trace. There was this hunter wine empire, this guy... David Anthony James was, he owned this company called James Estate Wines and multiple other companies within it, I think 10 or 11. And one of them included a wine investment services, which was warehousing for private collections. Good, warehousing. These warehouses are dangerous. (laughs) And it was, you know, 300 private collection owners had invested to keep their wine in these temperature controlled lockers, keep it all safe. And at this time, David Anthony James, who's the owner of all of these, is watching his company go through first receivership, which I also had to look up, which is when there's an offering to an insolvent company to recover and resume business operations. So he was in debt and he went through receivership to see if this company could help 
get him off back on the ground, get his feet back on the ground, etc. But I guess in this process, they decided just to sell it. But this time in 2013, David Anthony James had amassed 25 million Australian dollars in debt. Oh, so his five million, and he got it from the site. Is it going to help him much? I don't know. <laughs> so, and like this is a winery that apparently formally was recognized by both Australian and international wine judges. It won over three hundred medals from like its inception in a five year course. Like it was top notch wine with a really bad businessman in charge. Is what happened. And I was like trying to read this guy at the time. He's been going through a million different court battles. You know, one owing taxes, owing insurance fraud shit then also his wife divorced him during this process so she's trying to like, take him like it's really for a dead. shit ton of money that apparently he doesn't have and like their property and he's going through all of this and then on top of this this five million australian dollars worth of wine just up and disappears well how do we know he didn't try to do it to offset some of his debts or just take it and run away he's like i'm just gonna run away with five million dollars because they the wine is still like apparently missing. The collection that was stolen included 30,000 collectible and vintage Penfold Granges, Henschkes, and Torbrex wine. One of the bottles alone was a 1951 vintage of Penfold's Grange, and it sold for a record of 80,000 Australian dollars. It's wild. At auction. I mean, I like wine. I still have this big money wine. I still, because like, you're going to drink it. It's hard enough for me to, like, justify a $100 bottle of wine. It's, like, going to be, like, I got a promotion. <laughs> it's an anniversary. Right. It is a special birthday. <laughs> but, like, yeah, because you're going to drink it. It's going to be gone. Like, you're going to enjoy it. But, like, like, I just spent a cool 80000 on this, <laughs> <laughs> this wine. Fucking Pemple yeah. Grange. But he, this guy owned all these services and they – or companies, and they were going into liquidation. And I guess a large amount of this stolen wine was recovered – but not all. And the problem was they couldn't identify who it belonged to. So even though they found the wine, they didn't return it to people. And then apparently because it was maybe because it wasn't stored properly, it was inspected by cellaring experts when they deemed the cellar was substandard and the wine would no longer be of value anyway. Yeah. So they, they like trust these people to temperature control properly store the wines and they don't even do that or whenever it got like whenever it disappeared from the warehouse it got stored elsewhere like i'm just like imagining like just like a basic storage unit like, <laughs> like suburban australia like, that has like, like a like, locker on a yeah, lot yeah it's got no air conditioning it's just hot as balls when you open it and so even though they found some of the wine they couldn't identify who it belonged to anymore and it was bad i don't think anyone got their money back well that this. seems like a very failed wine heist <laughs> yeah, and I guess they started this thing was called Strike Force Farrington. And I guess that's like the police unit that was like set to investigate this. And in 2019, so this happened, started in 2013. In 2019, they just gave up. They're like, nope, we're done. Can't find it. It's been six years. No fucking clue where it is. <laughs> Strike I mean, Force. <laughs> this James guy has been in court off and on for years at this point. They know where he is. It's not like he disappeared too, but he's struggling with a million other accusations about him. <laughs> <laughs> and then his wife divorcing him. So he walks around. It's like everything's. My wine business is. Yeah. <laughs> My marriage is done. She realized I'm a fraud, so she left me too. I'm like, what are you going to divorce? What are, what, you're divorcing a man that has no fucking money anymore. But I guess she like got the property. I don't. It was. Well, she's like, I better get the assets before everything's gone. Yeah. So they could never find. Like, there was numerous inquiries by the owners, the liquidators of this business, the local police. It led to nothing as far as where most of the wine went who was in charge of it. Like, they still don't seem to pinpoint David Anthony James directly. I think it's just like, yeah, he seemed like a pretty shitty guy. But if you meet an Australian named David Anthony James. <laughs> don't go for it. It's going to be bad news bears. <laughs> so poor Australia in the time of, you know, 2013. But at the same time in 2013, there's in Champagne region of France, there's also a heist going on. I like this one. Champagne was having, 2013 was a tough year for wine. <laughs> Right. I was like, let's just steal it. So yeah, this champagne producer, Jacques Salas, he is a very boutique, small kind of... Yeah, but sounds like really sought after for people who know. I don't know. I've never seen anything of his stuff on his shelves, maybe because it's pricey. I think, I don't know what it costs, but I think he only makes like, he doesn't make that much a year. Maybe like 60,000 cases, which seems like a lot, but 
and the I guess when it be, it's like almost cult following to this. Apparently, him and his son when his when his dad, the, you know, the Jacques guy, Jacques Salas, opened it. They were actually like growing all their own grapes, and then his son went to winemaking school in Burgundy and turned it into like more of a champagne house rather than someone that's contracting grapes out. I guess so. It's to, and they have some really cool cuvées, and it's just small production, high priced, hard to find. But they, the thieves targeted him, like the actual producer, like his, per, like the personal seller, not his personal seller, but the business seller. The business seller, yeah. So they stole 300 cases of wine, which was worth nearly $350,000. But I they guess, also... Yeah, a few different types of the wine. Yeah, there's a few different ones. He had multiple cuvées, but I guess the... Uh, they sold... It was eight pallets of wine total. And most pallets fit around like 50 to 60 cases of wine, depending on the size of the bottle. But the ver- the original version, the ver- version original, Dick's... I think that's a typo. I think... I don't know what that says. Well, it could be. It's French. You know, there's lots of vowels Exquisite. that you don't pronounce. I think maybe it was exquisite. I don't know. Substance and the rosé. And then they also stole labels and bottle oh, neckers. So they're looking to counterfeit some, too. So that was the worry is that they're – and they also sold like 2,500 caps. But I sold 16,000 front labels, 12,000 neck labels, and I think that's supposed to be 2,500 caps. So I think what they were worried about then was the potential to counterfeit. But I guess they use a special black bottle so that maybe if they didn't have any bottles, they might not be able to. That's what they were saying. They're, I guess they're one of the very, very few houses that use an almost black champagne bottle instead of the traditional green. So they were hoping that would help. And then I guess also these pallets were determined or were destined to go to the U.S. and Japan. So that's why we've never had Salas, because it was it stolen. stolen. <laughs> there you go. Got stolen. Not because still, we can't afford it or find it. It was <laughs> eight pallets. It's like this is stuff like, yeah, like you need a forklift to move this stuff. <laughs> like you can't just like walk in and like grab a bottle and leave. Like, Does everyone have their forklift certification? Know how <laughs> to drive. Yes. Like, well, I guess there you go. So first things first, we want to become wine heisters, Calla. We got to get our learn how to drive a forklift. And and, and actually use it, spear the pallets without like knocking the... Don't just like go right into over. the cases. <laughs> that would be me. I'd be like, I got this. Again. <laughs> just knock over half. <laughs> yeah. I'd put the, yeah, put the, the forks underneath the boxes, but not underneath the pallet. Yeah. It would just like... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry you guys can't see Karen. I try to make hand gestures about how this would play out. The box is flying. They're everywhere. <laughs> I, I guess they never really said anything if they if they found anything counterfeited but i guess these labels since they were destined for the u.s and japan they already had the u.s and japanese import labels on them but had not yet put the french tax stamps on them i don't really know what oh, that of course. Means. that's convenient so, convenient that's convenient. <laughs> convenient so but it still made the labels difficult to strip off but i mean i've stripped a label off a bottle a bunch of times oh yeah what for well i, I used to for some reason i thought it was really cool to collect labels back in the day <laughs> <laughs> you are just no I wasn't to... like being Rudy Kiranow in here <laughs> we talked can't remember an episode we talked about him on but the guy that was forging bottles you know as I was just like I would keep them for personal reference and I had this stupid book filled with like labels in it one day I was like why the fuck do I have this oh that's cute <laughs> I but apparently wine forgery has more money in it than wine heisting so everyone knows but episode 59 is where we talk about Rudy and the biggest wine forgery. Yes, that and there's a documentary on Netflix about it too. But I don't know. So when I read that they could be hard to strip, in my head, I was like, it's really not that hard. And two, maybe that's why they stole all those labels just to relabel the actual bottles to make it seem like they weren't the US or Japanese import Especially bottles. Especially if like you made a note that they were most likely sold in Eastern Europe or Russia. So if they had to get off the, the import thing. That I'm not a detective here, but my assumption from listening to multiple true crime podcasts as a white woman of a certain age, <laughs> <laughs> it's like our porn these days is true crime. And that's what I was like. Maybe they stole those labels not to counterfeit, but to be able to resell ones that had U.S. and Japanese information on it. Because if you're finding a bunch of Japanese bottles, I'm assuming there's Japanese writing on it, like the characters. Like, yeah, I'd be like, why are pretty yeah, why big are you? giveaway? <laughs> Next, I wonder. I don't know. Like, you just have to have connections to different like brokers and distributors to be able to then move the wine out of the country but i guess yeah if you're working with somebody who's maybe more legit they'd be like why does this bottle have japanese 
markings markings on it. I mean, they said they went to the parallel. It could have gone to the parallel market, which means like brokers, restaurant tours, or smaller distributors in Europe who are able to find buyers in the U.S. and circumvent official distributor channels. So more private market shit is possibly how that went. I'm still very confused as to how you navigate that. I, I did read that a lot of this wine, maybe not necessarily this wine, but when you talk about like the multi-thousand dollar bottles, like those ones, they get into auction. But I wonder how auction houses aren't necessarily checking on the backstories of some of these bottles. Well, we've even talked about it on like the forgery one. It's just a very sketchy system. And I mean, with Rudy Kurnawan, essentially, when we talked about that episode 59, it's like he gained trust and that was all people needed. Right. They, they knew him as sort of an authority and they thought he was reputable so, so then- they didn't have to they didn't do like their due diligence to check and remember i think in that like that podcast they like brought this forged wine to a a fancy restaurant in new york city for a psalm tasting and all of them like this is 100 percent and like one person is like no it's not but everyone else is like oh it's from rudy it's totally fine so you get this reputation and people just don't think to do any research about it when it comes to wine i don't know it's either that the wine's still missing, it either went to Eastern Europe or other buyers and no one no one was found. This one is my favorite one though, because this one is ridiculous. Legends Cellar, Orange County, California. For it's a four four year. <laughs> a four year. Four year years. Nice. This is just fucking ridiculous to me in so many ways. So Legend Cellars is located in Irvine, California, and it's pretty much another warehouse. So here we go. Don't keep your wine in warehouses. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess this guy owned this wine warehouse where collectors pay to store their wine in temperature-controlled units. And over the course of four years, this guy, George Asumi, he was the operator there, and he stole $2.7 million worth of wine over four fucking years. It's like embezzling, but just taking wine, not monies. And what's hysterical to me is that just the process of this. So... His son, George's son, owned this business. So George is fucking with his son's business. But George gets better. No, he doesn't. He gets worse, but funny better. (laughs) He apparently was the operator. So he was there during the day helping people with their lockers, setting them up. But he had access to everyone's lockers. And I guess these wine lockers there can hold anywhere from 8 to 250 cases of wine. And that cost can be $325 a year to $2,750 a year. Honestly, it doesn't seem that expensive for storage. For a year, no. For a year, no. I mean, I think I've paid more than that for just basic storage. That's not temperature <laughs> controlled when I move and stuff like that. So next time you want to move, I mean, just, wonder, maybe there are small lockers. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they're holding only wine. But I guess... He would like hire these guys to do construction work and ask them to move boxes of one from one locker to another. And when he brought those boxes in, George would take the nice wine out and honestly just replace them with bottles of two buck chuck. Like literally two buck chuck? Yeah, like Trader Joe's. Like it was one of the wines he was putting into the box people wouldn't notice. <laughs> so this is what's funny. And when I first thought about this, I was like, oh, so he's emptying the nice wine into a bottle and then pouring Trader Joe's wine into the nice bottle. No, but he's just literally putting he's the bottle. He's taking one out. <laughs> 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 the other. So I guess this one guy, Jeffrey Stack, he was one of the locker owners there and he was storing his wines there since 2006 and he went to open a box of white wine from Domaine Le Flave, and it was the six bottles in there and they're worth $370 a piece and he opens this wine crate and there's six bottles of two buck truck chardonnay <laughs> labels and everything <laughs> like this guy George is not even trying to like <laughs> put the label on it from the original it's like ah, rich people they would not notice so this guy Jeffrey Stack lost one million dollars in wine from his collection due to this and so at first I was like, why the fuck is he not just transferring the wine from one bottle to another and, I don't know, whatever, forging labels. So this guy, Osumi, at the time, he was having his girlfriend sell the wine to a wine merchant called Belmont Wine Exchange of San Carlos. They sell wine in consignment. And his girlfriend would do that. And then she would get the money and he would take it from her 
to pay his lawyers because he was being indicted on 71 felony counts of tax and insurance fraud, identity theft, and perjury, plus other charges. So the money (laughs) he's getting from the stolen wine is going directly to his lawyers because he's already had so many issues with the law. Oh, God. Because he underreported his 3.5 million payroll from several businesses he owned in one of the cases. Yes! So this guy's already not off to the strike. So obviously the only person that would hire him is his son. But that clearly didn't work out either. So, But they said the girlfriend had no idea that this was stolen wine. I guess he was telling her that the clients were asking him to sell it to thin the wine collections without the wives knowing. So she had no idea she's selling stolen wine to Belmont Wine Exchange. The lawyers don't realize that the money that's coming to them is from stolen wine. They've all been cleared of those charges. I guess she backed out at one point when she found out that the money was going to the attorneys and not back to clients. Like, I guess when checks were being read to the attorneys, she thought that was just the client's name. And then eventually she's like, wow, this client's selling a lot of wine. <laughs> this sort of, she like says to him, like, no, I don't want to do this anymore, honey, but I still love you. <laughs> just won't stop won't keep doing it so then it made me realize why he's not dumping the bottles into other bottles he's needs the full package to sell these wines well it would take more time to like then counterfeit the bottle with the wine and exactly but to me i'm just like dude did you think that no one is gonna open their boxes of wine ever and find two buck chuck (laughs) it really is pretty special and i guess when this was happening they started to realize there's another guy, Robert Smelak, who said he, when he was moving his wine to the locker, I assume he was apparently standing over his shoulder and commenting on the collection, being like, oh, it's a nice fucking bottle. Nice fucking bottle. Nice, nice, nice. And he, like, raised concerns about the fact that the lockers had, like, outdoor hinges, so, like, anyone could just screwdriver it and pop it open. But Osumi was like, oh, don't worry, we have 24-hour surveillance videos, which is actually how he ended up getting busted. <laughs> was his own surveillance cameras that he like said when he got busted they looked at the surveillance cameras and they saw him taking the wine out of lockers into his own locker (laughs) (laughs) then bringing it back well jig is up so legend seller does it still exist i have no idea i don't know i actually didn't even look into that but i guess like he when he was investigated they like broke into osumi's private locker and there was like latex gloves nails that were used to seal the wine crates and another five hundred thousand dollars worth in wine that he had not been able to offload yet this guy just seems like a crappy person from the get-go well it's, i don't know it just seems like eventually the you know and he it did like i guess did he he didn't escape that one so he was able to pay his lawyers for the other one so it all caught up with him mm-hmm. all right well that's uh part one of our wine heist we've got more i guess Sometimes silly stories of crazy people stealing wine. It's just, this is, I mean, I love this. I can't wait for, I'm I'm happy we're doing part two of this. All right. Orgasms and alcohol. Double fist yourselves.